it's my pleasure to be here and talk about sun protection. Really, we want to take a sun protection 101 style approach to this, uh, to this webinar. And it's pretty apropos. I'm uh, sitting in Sacramento and we have 100 plus weather and I hope all of you are staying as cool as possible. And what we'd like to do, what I'd like to do is really go over how we can um, create a, a healthy relationship with the sun. I don't think sunlight should be only looked at as bad. Uh, there's definitely uh, a balance in how the sun can be good for you, but then we also have to respect the power of the sun and you know some of the damage that it can do. And so with that, today what I'd like to do is uh, let's have, um, let's go over an overview. We'll start with sunlight, UV light, a little bit of a background, and from there we can move into all these other topics. And we'll touch on everything uh, as we go along and hopefully if you have any questions you can put them into the chat window and if i'm not able to get to them today what we'll do is we'll definitely uh, address them as we go along to start with sunlight is very important all of life is really based on on sunlight sunlight has energy that clearly makes a lot of our plants go uh, if you put a plant in water for example and don't really give it much else nutrients it's able to take in what uh, the sunlight's able to give it and really, uh, really grow and sustain life on Earth. So from that perspective, I, I do want to say that sunlight's really important for, for life, but we also have to uh, take a close look at what, what kind of energy is being uh, delivered to us from sun. So if you look at the sun's um, energy, and as you might say, energy budget, and this is a nice little schematic from uh, Wikipedia, uh, you look at the incoming solar energy, quite a lot of it is reflected by the atmosphere and reflected by the clouds, but quite a lot of it actually gets to us. And uh, where it says at the bottom, uh, absorbed by land and oceans, um, that includes human beings too. Unfortunately, we will absorb some of that sunlight. And what we'd like to do is make sure when we're absorbing sunlight, we do it in a healthy way and not in a way that will lead to um, skin diseases and damage. When we think about the solar radiation spectrum, and this is really the most complicated graph that I'm going to put up, but the idea behind it is that sunlight is composed of multiple different forms of energy. We have UV energy, which is what we all talk about, but it also, we also have visible energy, which is visible light, which is how we see things, and then infrared, which really is the source of a lot of the warmth that you get from the sun. Um, it can affect things like circadian rhythm, uh, growth rates of plants. So there's a lot more in sunlight than just UV light, but today we're going to focus mostly on the UV. You can see here that a lot of UV light, which is between, between the very beginning of the graph up until 400, uh, you can see that it, there is quite a bit of sunlight. And as you go deeper into the UV light spectrum towards visible, you get more and more, um, more, and more abundant light. So when we really want to think about UV light, you can break that up into three forms. There's uh, UVC, which is at the very bottom here. It's the most powerful. Luckily, it doesn't get through the ozone. So if we have an intact ozone layer, it absorbs all of that UVC, which is ultraviolet type C. And it is very strong, but luckily it's, we are shielded from that. So what we're left with is ultraviolet B and ultraviolet A. And ultraviolet B is what causes burns. And the way I really think about that is B is for burns. And so it, it is more strong than, it is stronger than UVA, but it doesn't penetrate as deep. It, it only goes in through what's known as the top layers of the skin. Unfortunately, we have some very important skin cells that are there. So if you get too much of it, that's what can lead to uh, skin cancers and uh, damage. And then UVA, which is very abundant in the atmosphere, it's about medium strength and it goes in a little bit deeper so it can get down to uh, deeper parts of the skin. Uh, for example, areas where you have collagen and uh, that can be important in terms of staying youthful and having a youthful appearance. And if you get too much of it, it can start to break down the collagen so, so that uh, it, what, it, what can happen is that it can end up uh, leading to more wrinkles and uh, leathery skin. So let's really delve into a, a little bit more about each of these types of uh, ultraviolet light that get to us. So when you think about ultraviolet type A, it scatters much more in the clouds. Um, it is responsible for tanning. Uh, it's, it's much better at inducing tanning. And this is the part that I think is important so that we'll be talking about this more as we go along. 
it can get into the shade. So even if you're in the shade, realize that ultraviolet light can bounce from other, uh, other objects around you or scatter from the atmosphere and, and get in into the shade. Now UVA is split into two forms of UV. So there's UVA1 and UVA2. UVA2 is much higher energy. And the way they, they've distinguished these two is that UVA2 can cause um, more redness in the skin and it leads to more sunburns. And UVA1 largely does not. And uh, we're going to talk about this, but when you think about sunscreens and SPF, you're really trying to look at how well your sunscreen protects you from redness, in which case you're only going to be looking at ultraviolet B and ultraviolet A2. And so UVA1 will become important when we start thinking about long-term uh, approaches to uh, preventing sun damage and uh, ultraviolet protection. And then there's uh, UVB. And this is much higher energy. It is what leads to things like sun damage and sunburn, but it also is what leads to vitamin D. And that becomes relevant when we start thinking about um, prudent ways to expose yourself to sunlight. And on the flip side, uh, when you think about tanning boots, tanning boots don't provide UVB very rarely. And that's only in very special circumstances. The vast majority of tanning boots are UVA. And so you won't be helping your vitamin D status uh, by exposing yourself in a tanning booth, for example. So let's talk about a little bit more of the details on what happens uh, when UV and UVB get into your skin and um, they end up leading to some harmful effects. Both of these forms of ultraviolet light are high energy. And what that means is that you'll start to create high energy chemicals that can be very reactive. And some of these are known as Generally, they're known as free radicals, and some examples are, are superoxides, singlet oxygen, and both of these can lead to things like DNA damage. And so what happens is these very reactive uh, molecules can uh, attack surrounding proteins so that you can lead to disrupted proteins. You can damage a very important structures like collagen and elastin, and that's what leads to uh, eventually things that cause skin damage and lead to skin cancers. And that's what we're trying to avoid when we're thinking about the harmful effects. So with that as a background, next I'd like to talk about protective clothing. Protective clothing is a very, very important approach for sun hygiene. In fact, the reason I have it here above sunscreens is that um, protective clothing is the most important way you can protect yourself from sun damage. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about what it means to have protective clothing. So when we think about protective clothing, there's a really simple way you can think about how clothing protects all of us. And the way to think about it is you want to think about what color it is that you're wearing and then the four W's. And we're going to go through those four W's. So first of all, when you think about color, realize that lighter colors like white might and this is what uh, you know, our research has shown, uh, the research that I've been conducting, but other researchers have been showing this too, is that as you have lighter and lighter colors, many times ultraviolet light can get through a little bit more easily. And I'll show you some data behind that. Then we have weight. So how thick is your clothing? If you have very thin clothing, you can imagine that sunlight will get through that much more easily. And on the, uh, on the other hand, if you have thicker clothing, it's going to have to, ultraviolet light's going to have to work harder to get through all of that uh, thicker material. Then we have the weave. How tightly knit is your clothing? If you have a loose knitting to your clothing, that means you have a lot of holes in between. And so we're going to talk about what does that mean and what are some tricks that you can do to try to get the weave to become closer together. If your clothing has been washed or if it's brand new, sometimes that makes a difference and sometimes that touches back to this whole notion of weaving. Because some clothing, after you wash them, they will start to uh, contract and shrink and that shrinking allows the weave to become tighter. And when that happens and you have a tighter weave, uh, your clothing won't allow as much ultraviolet to come through. And then finally, what happens when your clothing gets wet? Many of us do this, uh, we'll send send our children out or our friends will go out or ourselves will go out into the pool or into, a, uh, into, the, into the beach surf and we'll put on a t-shirt um, or when we go snorkeling, we'll throw on a t-shirt or some sort of clothing, um, hoping that that'll give us that extra layer of protection. And it'll be important to understand 
you know, is there a better color to pick when uh, when your clothing gets wet? How does wetness change the way that your clothes can protect you? So when we think about color, and let's start with color, uh, there are so many different colors out there, and um, there have been some basic studies looking at how does color matter? Does color really matter? Does white become different than, say, a red, a green, a blue, or a yellow? In fact, they did this study, and this is um, from uh, many years ago. And, they, and uh, in this study, what they did was they looked at different clothes, and they looked at how well those clothes could protect you from uh, ultraviolet light. And these were all cotton t-shirts, and cotton seems to be a good one because cotton tends to breathe, you know, cotton feels good to wear, uh, so, and cotton feels light enough so that when you're in warm weather, um, a lot of people tend to wear cotton. And when they looked at uh, the results, um, this is what, you know, when you look at white, white was a reference point. So they looked at a white t-shirt and then they dyed it yellow and they dyed it blue. When they dyed it yellow, you can see there was a, a, a pretty large increase in how well it could protect um, from ultraviolet uh, light from getting through, almost to the order of a 200% increase. And then when uh, they used a blue dye, it was over 500% uh, on the uh, increase in protection. So it does matter if you're going to be wearing white, yellow, or blue. So if you're going to be outdoors, try to choose a color that's going to not get too hot like black, but maybe not be white so that you can find something that's in between and afford a little better protection. When it comes to the weight of the material, um, there was another study that looked at shirts and how heavy and uh, how light they are. And uh, I've shown the results from their study right here. If you look along the top line, that represents a, light, a, a lighter weight. And then the bottom line is a heavier weight. And you can see the lighter weight uh, if you look across the different columns. The very last column is uh, the most important. And this was a light white t-shirt had about an ultraviolet protective factor of 3.8. And this is when it's not wet. Just by changing the weight of the material, you can see that all, it goes up about five to six fold, and the ultra, ultraviolet protection factor goes up to 19.2. Of course, there comes a point in the summertime where you can't just be wearing heavy jackets that, that wouldn't feel very comfortable. But the idea being, if you have a choice between two t-shirts, and you have one that's a little bit slightly thicker, but still feels comfortable, go with the one that's slightly thicker, especially if you're gonna be outdoors. Now we alluded to this earlier, when we think about the weave of clothing, it's really important to think about how tightly packed in uh, the knitting is. And so here's two examples uh, where you can see that the knitting between the one on the left and the one on the right is very different. You can definitely see holes and the knitting is much more loose on the left hand side, whereas the knitting is much tighter on the right hand side. And as you can imagine, sunlight can't get through the fabric on the right, as well as it can get through the fabric on the left. So the, the, the way in this becomes relevant, especially when we think about white cotton t-shirts, and this could be any cotton t-shirts for that matter. But again, these investigators, uh, this, uh, this group of dermatologists and investigators, what they did was they studied what happens to white t-shirts when you put them through the wash and dry cycle. And they, uh, in this particular case, what they did was they took a white cotton t-shirt and they put it through the washer and the dryer five times, and they found out that just by shrinking it and by washing it five times, the ultraviolet protection factor increased by 50%. Now, that's something that even, you know, when I started lo looking at a lot of this data, I was a little bit uh, surprised as well. I didn't think there would be an increase by 50%. So you're thinking, you're, so what this means is usually white T-shirts that are about an SPF of three to four. And afterward, what they'll go up to about is an SPF of, of six. Now, if, you, if it's you or your child that's going out there and you have a choice, again, between a brand new shirt or one that's been pre-washed, if you can get it pre-washed, that'll afford you some level of protection. Um, so you want to choose something that's pre-washed, a little bit thicker, and go for a color that's not white. Go for something that's closer to the blues or the reds. And then finally, when we talk about what happens when the shirt gets wet, and you know we've all done this. We've all gone out uh, thinking, let's wear a, a white shirt or some sort of a t-shirt, and well, let's wear it in the pool so that, yes, we're going to wear sunscreen, but this will give us a, a, an added level of protection. Well, it turns out, as you can see here, that 
in, in, in the case of a white cotton t-shirt, when it gets wet, it decreases the ultraviolet protection factor by 57.1%. So on the order of about 60%, you lose that much extra protection because now with the wetness, the white t-shirt becomes more transparent and ultraviolet light is able to get through more easily. Now they studied this and they split it apart for ultraviolet A versus ultraviolet B. And you can see that, um, and here what, what I'm showing in this graph is it's the percent decrease in the ultraviolet protection factor. And whether it's water or salt water, you can see that there's a, approximately about, when you're just looking at UVA and UVB individually, about a 30% decrease. Now, I did say the ultraviolet protection factor went down by about 60%. So you might say, well, why is it 30% and 60% there? Ultraviolet protection factor takes into account a lot more than just UVA and UVB. Um, sometimes uh, when you're looking at ultraviolet protection factor, you're looking at other things like how quickly the skin became red and whatnot. But when you're looking at just UVA and UVB, they're just looking literally at how much ultraviolet light is getting through that, um, getting through that shirt. The reason salt water didn't seem to decrease as much is probably because the salt in the water itself has an ability to reflect some of the sunlight. So salt water will not, it, it'll be a, not as bad for the shirt when it gets wet, as opposed to just um, water that doesn't have as much particulates and salt in it. So which brings me to the final point, which is that instead of relying on your um, local department store bought t-shirt, there are much more elegantly made ultraviolet rated clothing. And the clothing is spe specifically made and tested and rated for ultraviolet protection. And the way they do it is they don't necessarily use cotton. They'll use a different fabric and they'll knit it at a very tight knit. And so it becomes much more resistant to changes in color and wetness because the knitting is done in a way that even if it's white, even if it's uh, a darker color, or even if it gets wet, and we've done some of these studies and we're gonna be publishing these studies pretty soon ourselves. Um, we've shown that if you take something that's specifically rated as an ultraviolet rated clothing, even when it gets wet, it holds its original ultraviolet rating. And that's very important because that sort of clothing you can wear when you go snorkeling or you can put on your child if they're going to the pool and you don't have to worry about what color it is. So it may be worth putting a little bit of investment into those kind of clothes uh, to prevent that one extra sunburn. And so in general, when we think about a practical approach for selecting clothing, if you can try to pick something that's ultraviolet rated, but if you can't, like we have this child here, go for something that's in the blues and make sure it's a heavier material and uh, also make sure that it's been pre-washed if it's cotton. But if you can uh, get an ultraviolet rated clothing, that's much better. I'd like to talk about sunscreens. Sunscreens are really important when we think about the total sun hygiene approach uh, when, when we're trying to uh, pr protect ourselves from sun overexposure. So along with protective clothing, sunscreens play a very important role. And one of the, one of the important things that we wanna talk about is how to select a sunscreen. How do you read the label? How do people choose sunscreen? We did a large study that um, included a lot of the people at the university and the general public, and we asked them the simple question. We said, how do you pick your sunscreen? By and large, and not only in the general public, but even amongst our medical students and amongst some of the other physicians, time and time again, people use SPF as the number one way that they choose, in, uh, the number one way in how they select a sunscreen. And I'm going to talk to you about why that might be, that is important, but might not be the best way to choose sunscreens. And what you want to do is you want to aim to choose your sunscreens based on the ingredients before you think about SPF. And so let's talk a little bit more about that. But before we get into that, I'd like to talk a little bit more about what does SPF actually mean? What does SPF stand for? And SPF is... When you, when you define the whole um, measurement tool, it's the sun protection factor, and it's defined as the ratio of the dose of ultraviolet night, light needed to cause skin redness in skin that's protected by sunscreen compared to skin that never saw the sunscreen. So in other words, if you had something that had an SPF of two, it would mean that you need twice the amount of dose to 
before your skin turns red as compared to skin that didn't have that SPF2 on it. So likewise, if you have something with SPF 30, you need 30 times the dose. So um, one thing to remember though, is that because we're looking at redness as the measure, as I had alluded to um, in er earlier, um, ultraviolet B is much more responsible for redness and that little sliver of ultraviolet A, ultraviolet A type two, both of those together lead to redness in the skin, but you're not really measuring the effects of ultraviolet type uh, type type one. And so it's not total sun protection. And sometimes we can get lulled into a false sense of security to think that SPF is total sun protection. It's not. What it is is it just refers to ultraviolet B and a little thin portion of ultraviolet A. When we think about how much UVB is actually blocked at different SPF levels, this is a really nice, nice graph that shows how much extra protection you get as you go up in SPF. And if, if you look at the, the table that I've got accompanied along with it, you'll see that, for example, with an SPF of two, you're blocking 50% of the UVB. But as you go up and up, and the magic zone, the American Academy of Dermatology suggests that you use an, at least an SPF 30 sunscreen. And the reason for that is at that point, you're blocking over 95%, and in this case, 96.7% of, of, of the uh, ultraviolet B that's coming through. But as you go up and up, you're not getting that much more protection anymore. Um, what you're doing is you're from 30 to 50, you see you're only going up to 98, and from 50 to 100, you get one extra percent. And what I would say is uh, focus on the ingredients and then look at SPF. So let's, let's talk about the different factors that affect sunscreen. So we have five main factors. One is how thick do you put on the sunscreen? The next one is what kind of formulation are you using in the sunscreen? I know that now with spray sunscreens available, a lot of people, there's a big debate between, should I use a cream? Should I use a spray? And then they also have powdered sunscreens. So we'll touch on that. Sunscreen ingredients, I'm sure many of you think about. Uh, it's, it's something that, it's hard to wrap your head around, especially because when I turn uh, the sunscreen bottle over, I can't even pronounce half the stuff that's on there. But we're going to try to break that down. Then there's also environment. How does the envi environment affect how the sunscreen is sitting on your skin? And believe it or not, your skin's anatomy uh, will require you to reapply sunscreen. We'll go over uh, the science behind why it's really important to reapply. So let's start with thickness. The FDA mandates that all sunscreens are tested at two milligrams per square centimeter. And you can see that's the dotted vertical line going up and down. All of these names that you see along the left-hand column represent studies that have independent studies that have been done to test how thick do people actually put on their sunscreens in the real world. And some of these studies have looked at other dermatologists. They've looked at other people with skin diseases that are sensitive to sun. So, you know, not just people that are healthy for the most part and trying to put on sunscreen to stay, stay um, from getting a sunburn, but people that truly know the science behind sunscreens and also ones that could have health consequences um, that are much beyond a uh, sunburn, but could lead to other issues, uh, especially if they get exposed. And what you can see here is no one is applying sunscreens up to that two milligram per centimeter square mark. Everyone is sitting around 0.5 to one. And so what does that mean? Well, what that means is that the guidelines don't really match real world use. And the guidelines are at two. And what we're doing is putting it on at 0.5 to one milligram. So what that means is that the SPF on the label will not be exactly accurate with regards to how the sunscreen is being used by you in the real world. So when we look at how that translates to um, the SPF that's put on the label, if you look at the left column, this is what would, you'd be reading on your uh, sunscreen labels. And if you look at the middle column and the right column, this is when you put sunscreens on at about 1 or 0.5 and represents much more real world applications. So if you look at an SPF of, let's say, um, 30, for example, uh, you'll see that what you'll actually end up getting, if you put it on at one milligram per centimeter squared, is about six to 15 on the SPF. And if you put it on pretty thin at 0.5, then what you're getting is about two to eight. It's easy to say, oh, people aren't using sunscreens properly, but we know that when people put it on at two milligrams per centimeter squared, that's pretty thick and it gets uncomfortable for people. So 
we do know that at the end of the day, what people are going to end up getting is about one milligram per centimeter squared, and that's comfortable. And it turns out that you need about an SPF two to four to prevent a sunburn. But if you're if it's a particularly hot day or you're going to be outdoors for a while, the way to to combat this is that you reapply so that the first application that you put on, it'll feel comfortable. You put it on about 0.5 to one, and then you put on a second application very soon. That's how you can bolster that application. So you're getting closer to the two milligrams per centimeter squared without having to glop it on all at once. And so I tell my patients to, to separate how they put it on, put it on and then put on a second coat within five to 10 minutes. And I'll give you another reason why you want to do that pretty soon as well. We're going to go over a little bit about the skin anatomy. When we do that, um, you'll see why that's important. So let's talk a little bit about sunscreen ingredients. This is probably one of the most important and most frequently asked questions I get when I talk to people about sunscreens and my patients about sunscreens. They really want to know about different ingredients. How safe are these ingredients? What ingredients should I be using? What ingredients should I be avoiding? So why don't we delve into that a little bit? So let me start by saying, and this is a very generic label. The FDA puts out this label on how new sunscreens are supposed to be labeled. And I wanted to just get you acquainted with reading your labels because sometimes it gets, um, I, I found these very intimidating to read before I really delved into this topic. So for starters, you want to look at the ingredients and they split them apart. There are active ingredients and then there are inactive ingredients. And the reason they have it like that is that sunscreens are actually regarded as a drug by the FDA because what you're trying to do is you're trying to protect the skin from uh, developing things like skin cancers, skin aging, and sunburns. Active ingredients are those chemicals or those molecules or those compounds that literally are responsible for, for either absorbing or reflecting the sunlight. And so they're the ones that are, that are being measured as uh, the actual active components. The inactive ingredients uh, down below can be a whole slew of things. They can be like botanical extracts, uh, fragrances, uh, whatever it takes to make the cream feel nice. Uh, sometimes there'll be a lot of water in there. As you can see in this example, it's the last ingredient. Um, and sometimes I'll put in things like vitamin E or other preservatives. Um, you can see there's a few preservatives in here as well. So that's, that's to, situate you, to situate you to the active and inactive ingredients. And we'll come back to this. There are also, you want to look for the, the, the notion that the sunscreen is broad spectrum. And again, I, you can, if you'll notice, I haven't even talked about SPF yet because you shouldn't be looking at SPF yet. First, you want to look at the active ingredients. Um, this is, not that you have to look at the inactive ingredients, just know that there's an active and inactive ingredient. Look for broad spectrum. What that means is that it's been tested and shown to be protective against both UVA and UVB. Remember, SPF is really only looking at UVB, but they have some additional testing that the FDA requires to show that the sunscreen can also protect against UVA. And if it meets those criteria, then they can put a broad spectrum uh, label on the sunscreen. So you wanna look for that as the, uh, the second item. Then you wanna look at the SPF. And uh, again, as I had mentioned, the American Academy of Dermatology recommends that you use SPF 30. Um, you don't need to go to 50 or 100 or 1,000. Uh, the recommendations stay at 30 because the ingredients and the broad spectrum are very, very important. And then finally, you might be interested in getting something that has water resistance to it. And we'll talk about what that means and uh, what that translates to when we're thinking about uh, spending time in water. So let's start with the active ingredients. So active ingredients are largely broken up into two forms of active ingredients. You have mineral or physical sunscreens and you have chemical sunscreens. The way the mineral, mineral sunscreens work, and two examples here are zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, they will physically reflect and they'll absorb UV. Now, because they reflect UV, that's why they have a whitish appearance to them. And so they've tried to now what's known as micronize the zinc and the titanium so that it'll absorb in the UV region, but then it won't absorb in the visible light region, I mean reflect excuse me, it'll reflect in the ultraviolet region, but it won't reflect in the visible region. So it makes it a little bit more invisible. Um, and we'll go over some of the controversies with micronized uh, zinc and titanium dioxide, but that's how mineral sunscreens work. Chemical sunscreens, on the other hand, really focus on absorption. 
And so you have a lot of the chemicals um, that you see on the back of your sunscreen um, in the uh, active ingredient list. Some of the examples will be oxybenzone, benzophenone, octyl methoxycinnamate. You'll see all of these, I put an indicated where it absorbs to. UVB, UVB, UVB for the first three. So if your sunscreen only has those in there, it's not broad spectrum. To get broad spectrum, you need to include uh, chemicals like avobenzone or ecamsol. E and uh, or or some of these many of these sunscreens, what they'll do is they'll have a mix. They'll have a mix of chemical sunscreens that'll include things like zinc or titanium dioxide, and the two together will give it a broad spectrum protection. But this is how sunscreen active ingredients are largely broken broken apart and broken down. When you think about the inactive ingredients, uh, it's a funny term because. Um, Inactive just refers to the fact that it's not part of the drug that's being evaluated, meaning the actual sun um, either absorber or reflector. So they do, they're not thought to officially contribute to the SPF rating. However, inactive ingredients are anything but inactive. I mean, there's a lot of different hidden ingredients in there that may be responsible for um, different reactions you might have on your skin. One example I'll give you is if uh, sunscreen has fragrances in there and you tend to have a sensitivity, those fragrance will, fragrances will um, play a role in your skin becoming irritated or not. So we're gonna get back to inactive ingredients uh, in, in a little bit here. But just to give you a, a little bit greater of a snapshot, you can see these inactive ingredients include things like aloe extract in this case, jojoba oil, disodium, EDTA, which is a preservative. You also have methylparaben, polyparaben, which are also preservatives, and uh, um, vitamin E, for example. So many different compounds that really go into inactive ingredients. But let's talk a little bit about the controversies. And I'm only gonna touch upon them today, and we can delve into a little bit more detail, maybe at a future time point. But when it comes to the active ingredients, uh, two of the controversies that comes up is whether these um, chemical sunscreens to the skin and have an effect. And for example, oxybenzone and benzophenone, um, one of the worries that has been there is that, you know, if you, if you put these sunscreens onto your skin, do they become what are known as hormone disruptors? So many studies have shown that when you, uh, when you apply sunscreen onto the skin, especially over a large area of your skin, these compounds do get absorbed and they've measured them out in the urine. When people pee, they can measure these sunscreen getting in. Now, what we don't know though, is what are the long-term effects? Uh, there hasn't been any side effect that's been uh, reproducibly shown in any study. So realize that yes, these sunscreens are getting in, but um, research hasn't identified an exact way that uh, they're affecting the body. And then in terms of micronized zinc and titanium, uh, they have shown that micronized titanium, for example, can penetrate in past the dead layer of skin and get into the first layer uh, of your skin known as the epidermis, but uh, it becomes much harder for it to penetrate past that because it's a pretty tough barrier at that point. Titanium may get in around the hair follicles, and they've shown that sometimes it can get into the deeper parts of the skin through the hair follicles. Um, so the jury's still out on micronized zinc and titanium. What I do tell my patients, though, is that if they're gonna be wearing a, a powdered sunscreen on their face and they're putting the powder on and it has micronized components, I tell people to gently breathe out, um, not because there's anything proven, but I'd rather not having these, have these micronized particles getting breathed in and then going into the lungs. Because they're micronized, they will travel far distances and they'll get into the lungs. And so I'd rather them, you know, I just err on the side of caution, but I don't have any data to say that it's dangerous but I err on the side of caution and tell people to breathe out gently. And then we have the inactive ingredients and probably one of the most controversial ingredients, and I'd like to spend a couple minutes on this, is retinal palmitate. Retinal palmitate is a form of vitamin A that's, uh, that's put into a, a chemically synthesized form and put into sunscreens. And one of the worries that had been there originally, and there've been a few studies in mice, and um, they've shown that there's a possibility that when retinal palmitate is exposed to light, it'll break down and it can cause a bit more damage to the surrounding cells. And uh, there have been some studies, and, and you, you should look into the controversy uh, yourselves. The Environmental Working Group, which is a nonprofit organization that uh, tries to serve as a consumer watchdog, 
um, what they what they did was they did some evaluations on uh, retinal. They looked at the data for retinal palmitate, and the FDA had been looking at retinal palmitate as well. And uh, they actually the FDA did the original studies, and they showed that mice may form tumors at a faster rate when uh, when they're exposed to very high doses of sunlight, uh, and they have retinal palmitate on their skin. So has this been reproduced in um, in humans? No, it hasn't. It hasn't been reproduced in humans. It's uh, largely been studies from um, uh, from rodents. So if you're concerned about it, then just check the inactive ingredients and um, select a sunscreen that doesn't have it in there. And if you look at the, da the data and say, this doesn't bother me, then you don't need to worry about it. But I, I raise this just so that you're aware that you have to look in the inactive ingredient section to see if it's there or not. And then, you know, some people have um, sensitivities to fragrances, especially if you are someone that tends to have a very sensitive skin or if you have eczema. Uh, some people just don't do well with fragrances, and I'm one of them. Uh, I, I have sensitive skin, and so if I have a fragrance in there that's uh, strong, then sometimes that will lead to an irritation. Now, I do need to also um, warn that fragrances aren't just fragrances, and they're not always listed as fragrances. Sometimes botanical extracts can be fragrances too. So while we think of plant extracts as being really healthy and helpful, sometimes they're actually contributing chemicals that can be irritating to the skin as well. And then some people worry about parabens. Parabens um, have largely, the controversy is surrounded whether they um, can also serve as uh, hormonal modulators and affect um, you know, different kind of processes inside the body and affect it in different ways by, stim by either being stimulatory or not in terms of their hormonal abilities, their estrogenic abilities. And so if you're looking for something paraben free, look in that inactive ingredient area. Many times now sunscreens are labeling themselves as paraben free, but if you want to look for parabens, look in the inactive uh, ingredient section and you can see if there's parabens in there or not. I like to talk a little bit about formulation. Many of us will use cream sunscreens and many of us uh, will use spray sunscreens. Now spray sunscreens are clearly convenient. You can just, you, you clearly just push down on the nozzle and away you go and you've got it coating your entire skin. Um, now we did, we did a study at uh, UC Davis where we looked at a comparison between um, cream sunscreens and spray sunscreens. And we tested it on people that were very outdoorsy and used to using sunscreens. And what we found, and uh, the data, we're gonna be publishing it um, at some point, but I'll tell you what we found. We found that there is a risk that you put on less sunscreen when you, when you use a spray. Um, you wanna make sure you really get on a second coat when you do the spray, because uh, it's very easy to just spray a very thin coat. And if you remember, I showed you earlier, if you put on a thin coat, you might not get the full SPF that you're hoping to get. In fact, you'd get a much, much, much reduced SPF uh, factor in your sunscreen. Um, and also in general, probably less sun protection. And uh, studies have shown that the people that wear creams tend to get a much higher dose of sunscreen onto their body. So I, I definitely understand though why the spray can be more convenient, especially if you have a wiggly child or um, you just want to spray and go, um, then, make sure you put on a couple extra coats if you're going to do the spray. It used to be that only chemical sunscreens could be uh, converted into a spray sunscreen, but that's changed now. And a lot of manufacturers have figured out how to incorporate zinc oxide into the spray uh, approach. And so uh, sprays can work, but just be mindful that you're going to get less on any one given coat. So just be careful about that. And then I already made the comment about powders. Powders, I think, are fine. Uh, I have no issues with powders. They're elegant, nice to put on the face, especially for daily wear. Just breathe out gently if you have micronized zinc in that powder, because um, I just don't know what that micronized uh, component is going to do long term. Environment plays a very important role. And the reason I bring this up is that sunscreens are, they are tested for water resistance, but they don't use chlorinated water and they don't use salt water. They don't go through splash testing. If you look at the official wording, it's moderate activity, but I doubt it's people splashing around and um, you know, really moving around and jumping around the water. And so if you're at the beach and you know, you're frolicking right on the edge of the surf or your child is you know, in there and falling down and rolling around and probably having a great time, 
realize that some of the beach sand might rub off the sunscreen too. And uh, finally, there's no actual sweat testing. Usually what uh, people do is, uh, in the past, historically, what has been done is you water resistant testing and then you put the label on for sweat testing. The FDA has now come down on things like sweat proof and waterproof. You can't use the word proof anymore. And for that matter, you can't use the word sunblock anymore. I know we colloquially use the word sunblock, but you're not allowed to, they're not, manufacturers are, allow, are, are not allowed to put the word sunblock, uh, only sunscreen. And, and the reason for that is it's not holistically protective. So I, I promised you that I'd talk a little bit about skin anatomy. And if you look at this uh, schematic that I've got here, the wavy line represents the gentle undulations on your skin, the up and down texture of your skin. Your skin isn't a isn't flat glass plate. It has this natural variation where it goes up and down microscopically right at the surface. And so if you put sunscreen on and the, the white stripe along the top represents sunscreen. And if you put sunscreen on and you give it a little bit of time to settle, guess what happens? It all falls into those valleys and your peaks are exposed. And so even though you might have diligently put on your sunscreen really quick and you're out there to go run, run around and do whatever it is you want in the sun, that sunscreen is gonna settle into the skin and get into the valleys. And then you're gonna be left with areas, holes really, where you're not protected. And so the way you wanna approach that is you wanna reapply the sunscreen. This is yet another reason why you wanna reapply. If anything, uh, just the simple fact that you don't have the sunscreen everywhere uh, after just one application should be motivation enough to make sure you reapply. People say to wait 15 minutes, but sometimes that's not practical. And even if you just wait five minutes, even if you just wait three minutes, getting a second coat on will make a big difference. So you wanna start incorporating that into your habit, especially with children, because you don't want them to have holes in there because um, it's clearly been shown that uh, if you even get one bad sunburn when you're a child, the studies have shown that the risk for melanoma gets increased from twofold to up to sixfold. So that's a big deal. And so we want to try to avoid sunburns in everyone, but especially in children. Tanning is socially so important. And uh, it's become so important because of the way that it's viewed. And I think it's, it's worth talking about tanning a little bit when we talk about sun protection. If you talk to dermatologists, they will say that tan skin is damaged skin. Uh, of course, you have to balance that on the flip side where socially tan skin is thought of as healthy skin. Even when I go on vacation and I come back uh, to the clinic, people will say, oh, you look tanned, you look really refreshed, you look healthy. We've almost got this in our psyche that tan skin is healthier and uh, tan skin is, uh, it's got a better glow to it. So, you know, I want to talk about what are some of the ways you can approach tanning but try to be safe about it. Now, just some background on tanning itself. Your skin is chock full of natural antioxidants, and a couple examples include vitamin E and vitamin C. You might not realize this, but if you're out in the sunlight and um, you haven't gotten to the point where you're burned, you're only about, and studies have shown this, and I've put the reference down below, uh, in 1998, they did the study, and they showed that people that were outside and got exposed to sunlight and didn't get, didn't, they didn't turn red, but they got three fourths of the way to turning red. And the way they can keep track of that is they know what dose turns your red. And so what they do is they dial that back and only give you three fourths the dose. Those people lost 50% of their natural vitamin E. That means you're, you're depleting all the natural antioxidants in your skin pretty quickly when you're out in sunlight. And it doesn't take long to hit that, especially if, for example, you're a redhead or you, know, uh, you have very sensitive skin, a lot of freckles, very pale, realize that you really don't have any margin to be out in the sun for too long and uh, very short exposure times can end up leading to uh, pretty large losses of the natural antioxidants. And the worst time to go tanning, uh, and I don't advocate tanning in general, but the worst time to go tanning is midday. So you don't wanna be out there in the midday sun and tan. Um, a lot of people talk about vitamin D. Turns out you don't need that much time to get vitamin D um, and uh, sunburning is definitely not going to help the situation. There are some alternate ways to tan if you're going to tan, um, and I'll talk about four of them here. Uh, one of them is spray tanning. Spray tanning is an excellent option. It's, uh, it, basically what, what happens is they spray this uh, substance on your skin that will then react with the very surface of your skin and give you uh, a little bit of a glow. 
now we all know that spray tanning can sometimes not look the best. Sometimes you get an orangish look. So, you know, they've started to refine that technology though. So you may want to talk to some salons about what kind of spray tanning options they have. It used to be really bad in the past, but now they've started to get a little bit smarter about the colors that they can get from the spray tan. Shade tanning is really an important notion. Uh, you might not realize this, but when you're in the shade, you're still getting exposed to quite a bit of UVA and UVB. And I'm going to show you some studies later on about shade tanning. Um, exercise tanning is a great way to stay in shape, exercise, still get a little bit of that sun exposure. Yes, it won't be unless you're going to be running around nude and please don't do that. I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't appreciate um, people running around nude. But in general, if you're going to exercise, that is a way to get a little extra tan to the face and to the arms. You still wear your sunscreen. Believe it or not, you still tan even if you wear sunscreen because your sunscreen is not that good. So um, for that reason, uh, I do advocate for people to go exercise early in the morning when the sun is low on the horizon. You're still going to get the UVA coming through um, and you'll get your exercise in and you'll, you'll get the tan without putting yourself at risk for the burn. And then this whole concept of food tanning. Um, there's foods that are uh, rich in pigmented uh, chemicals. And when I say pigmented chemicals, things like beta carotene, many of you are familiar with this, uh, you know, in, or in uh, carrots, that orange color or uh, tomatoes with lycopene. And they've shown that when people start to eat more um, colorful fruits and vegetables, you can actually impart a slight food tan to the skin. And they've shown that uh, in previous studies that people that have a, a slight food tan are perceived as having a nice healthy glow as well. Wouldn't that be a better way to get your tan? Uh, do it with healthy eating. So let's talk about how shady is this shade. So there was this nice study, it just came out. Um, it, it published in 2017. And it was a study of people uh, under an umbrella on the beach. And they basically took 41 people, put them under an umbrella, and the researchers um, kept reminding people to stay under the shade. So they didn't allow them to peek outside of the shade. They actually followed them the whole day. Um, I don't know if I'd want to be the person that's trying to relax and having this person keep telling me to move as the shade moves. But that being said, these 41 people, they stayed under the umbrella the entire time, and 17 of them still got a sunburn. 41%. So even in the shade, you can get a sunburn. It turns out that beach and water uh, can reflect both UVA and UVB into the shade, and sometimes to the tune of about 30% reflection up to even 50% reflection. And so it's really important, even if you're in the shade, you want to still be sure that you wear um, sun protective clothing for areas that are sensitive, um, and absolutely definitely wear the sunscreen, because you are going to get ultraviolet B and ultraviolet A and um, shade is not 100% um, protection. We are doing studies now on this as well, and we're showing that not only under a beach umbrella, but we did studies in tree shade, showing that uh, also tree shade isn't 100% protective either. It's always better to be in the shade rather than in direct sunlight if you have a choice, but realize that shade is not 100% protective. I wanted to talk about a few sun exposure tips. So when we start thinking about um, our approach to sun care and uh, sun hygiene, there are a couple tips that you might not have thought at first blush that could really help you with your sun protection. And uh, this can help incorporate a few habits that can be fun habits, but also bolster the sun protection that you have for your skin. The first is make sure you look at the UV index. The UV index is a measure of how intense the sunlight is in your area. And um, as you can see here, this is an example from New York. If you look at the very bottom curve, um, the way they grade UV index, if you look at the left-hand side, is it goes from 0 to 10 and above 10, where it becomes severe. And the lower the numbers, uh, the less intense is the sunlight. And you can see at the, the lowest curve here, this rep represents um, the UV index in December. And you can see that as you go from left to right, it's basically looking at daylight from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And you can see that the peak is right in the middle from 10 to 2. And this is the reason why we tell people to uh, stay out of uh, sunlight, if possible, from 10 to 2, um, or be very careful when you're going to be out in the sunlight because you can burn much more easily. And look at how much of a rapid change there is, uh, not rapid, um, substantial change just in terms of the UV index when you go from December to July. In July, uh, at the peak, you're hitting a UV index of 10, which is you know, you have to be very careful. Um, but then the UV index is much, much lower 
uh, in the winter months. Now, obviously, this is flipped if you're in the southern hemisphere and uh, the sunlight's going to, your summertime is going to be in December. But you know what your UV index is. They're now making sensors that can tell you what your UV index is. Uh, hopefully, soon they'll have apps that you can tether to your your watch if you have a smartwatch where they can tell you what what the UV index is outside, and they can gauge uh, uh, they can gauge how much time it would take for you to burn on average. So there are all these neat little tools that are starting to come out. But the idea being keep track of the UV index, especially if you're going on a trip. Keep track of what the UV index is outside. Secondly, there are some things you can do to prepare your skin. You don't have to just rely on clothing, sunscreen, and avoiding uh, sunlight. Now, all the, uh, avoiding intense sunlight. All of those three approaches are very important for sun hygiene, but you can actually do better. There are some oral and topical approaches that can be easy to incorporate into your lifestyle that um, can help bolster the sun protection to your skin. And here are three examples. Uh, one is polypodium leucotomus. It is a fern extract that you can get in capsule form. And you can start taking that on a regular basis. And it's been shown that it can improve your uh, ability to stave off a sunburn. Same thing with beta carotene. Yes, you can eat a bucket load of carrots every day or um, other substances, other, other foods that have uh, carotenoids, which are the kind of compound that can help with sun protection. But they've done studies where if you take beta carotene and get beta carotene supplements, and the dose that they've done uh, for beta carotene is about 60 milligrams a day. They've looked at a wide range of doses. It seems like 60 milligrams of a day is uh, the point where you really get some benefit. You can, um, you can change your sunburn threshold. Now, it doesn't mean that if you take these supplements that you shouldn't still wear your sunscreen and you shouldn't, still shouldn't wear um, clothing that's going to be protective. But the idea is to give you an extra edge on top of that. And new emerging research is looking at nicotinamide. That's not the same as nicotine. I had a funny conversation with my patient pretty recently about this. It's not the same as nicotine. Nicotinamide is actually uh, a vitamin. It's, uh, it's what's known as the amide form of um, niacin. The other word for nicotinamide is niacinamide. They're both the same thing. But it's vitamin B3. And it's been shown to have sun protective effects. And what they're showing now is that if you start to incorporate nicotinamide, it may help uh, stave off things like precancers and skin cancers from developing. Again, you don't want to just focus on nicotinamide as your only approach, but you can start to incorporate that into a holistic approach when you think about uh, sun care and sun protection. And then you have topical agents that you can apply before you put on your sunscreen. Why not? Put something on that feels good, that's going to bolster your uh, sun protection, and um, you know, maybe give you a little bit uh, extra soothing, uh, soothing nature to the skin. So vitamin E oil is something, or raspberry seed oil. Raspberry seed oil is um, chock full of antioxidants, and uh, it's rich in, uh, in uh, protective uh, agents for your skin. So what, what I recommend to people is put that on uh, and let it, let it seep in and sink in. The nice thing about oils is they'll absorb. They'll absorb nicely into the skin. So put it on, let it sit for about two minutes, five minutes, then put on your sunscreen. And uh, this, is, this would be a nice approach to try with uh, children as well. My only um, uh, warning, though, is that some people, and not everyone, but there's a few of us that are going to react to oils when we put them on our skin. So if you're the type of person that tends to have sensitive skin, you want to test this in a small zone before you put it on. But again, these approaches aren't meant to serve as a replacement, but more as um, an addition to sun, sun protective clothing, uh, being prudent with how you expose yourself, and also sunscreens. Tip number three is that no matter what the sunscreen label says for water resistance, and I want to talk about water resistance very briefly here. When you go into the water, um, whether it's a pool or a beach, when you get out, make sure you reapply. If you're going to put on body oil, make sure you reapply that body oil and make sure you uh, reapply the sunscreen. No matter what the resistance is, like I had mentioned, they don't test it in chlor excuse me, chlorinated water, and they don't test it in, uh, in salt water. So we don't know exactly how the sunscreen is doing in both those cases. There are two labels that can go onto your sunscreen in terms of water resistance. There is the label that's known as water resistant, and that's when they've done the testing over 40 minutes. Or they can put on very water resistant, and that's when they've done the testing over 80 minutes. 
Um, if you see things that say waterproof, doesn't exist anymore. It's not allowed. Um, so waterproof doesn't, it, it, that's just a carryover. And, and the FDA is looking at making sure we don't use those words uh, at this point. And, uh, and I, I did say I wanted to make a comment about sweat. So when I, under tip three, I see here, I say water resistant, but if you sweat a lot, you want to reapply the sunscreen as well. Um, there is no sun sweat resistant testing and they only rely on water resistant testing to put that sweat resistant uh, label in, especially in the past. And there are no sweat resistant testing protocols now. So if you um, are playing sports or you're outdoors on the beach hanging out but end up sweating because of the heat or for whatever reason you know if you're just doing some daily activities and you end up sweating um, make sure you reapply the sunscreen because that's really important finally i wanted to uh, end with some more sun exposure tips uh, when we when we think about vitamin d supplementation and the role of vitamin d and how we can bolster the vitamin d that we have naturally so here's a few factoids about vitamin D. You don't want to rely on sunlight to give you all the vitamin D that you need. You don't, you don't because what can happen is that um, it, it really depends on your skin type. If you tend to burn really easily, I really don't advocate going outside for the vitamin D exposure because if you sunburn, then um, you, you're really, now the, the, the balance has been tipped in favor of harmful effects. And so you don't want to just rely on sunlight and realize that um, sunscreens do not block vitamin D production all the way together. We know sunscreens are supposed to protect you from UVB, but as you saw earlier, um, people don't put on sunscreens at a very thick amount. And regardless, uh, um, and e even if you're able to achieve that thick amount, there are other ways to get vitamin D. And we're gonna talk about that in the, in the next slide. But um, sunscreens don't block all vitamin D production. Realize that, again, you do have these peaks and valleys on your skin, these microanatomy. And so when the sunscreen does settle, there are going to be regions where you have a lot thinner layers of sunscreen. And the ultraviolet light will probably be able to get through in those zones. So you'll still be able to produce the vitamin D. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, you want to also include supplementation. and then. Tanning boots use mostly UVA, so they don't help you with producing vitamin D. Here's a few more things about vitamin D, um, especially if you're thinking about supplements. Vitamin D3 is better than vitamin D2 in improving your vitamin D levels. Um, there have been multiple studies that have shown that D3 is much better at augmenting or increasing that vitamin D level in the body. Um, now, most vitamin D3 comes from animal sources. So for vegans, by and large, vitamin D2 really is the option. However, there are a few algae-based sources that, that are now being used to, um, to get the vitamin D3. So you can, you can see if some of the vitamin D3 is vegan or not and uh, take a look. But for all of the people that are vegan, whether it be you or um, other friends or family members that you know, um, one of the things to think about is you can get vitamin D3, but they just have to look to make sure it was sourced in a vegan fashion. So to summarize what we've been able to talk about today, um, sun hygiene really requires the, the, the right approach that includes sun protective clothing, smart sun exposure, and correct sunscreen use. And by smart sun exposure, I really do mean don't go out there in the middle of the day when you have the highest chance of burning. Try to, try to go out when the sun's not so intense so that you can still enjoy sunlight without being right in the direct line of the very intense sunlight. Read sunscreen labels carefully and reapply often. I hope I uh, gave you a little bit better of a handle on how to read these sunscreen labels. And I think it's important to take a holistic approach to sun care. And you can prime your skin for good sun protection and in doing so, you can truly develop a healthy relationship with sunlight. With that, I would like to thank all of you uh, for taking your time to spend this evening with us.